Thank you. Uh, don't you guys have anything important to do today? Get to work. Um, I, I will tell you, um, I watched the deans uh, on, uh, at my desk while I was doing some last minute editing. And you did a great job. You didn't embarrass us. So we appreciated that. <laughs> I also uh, watched uh, Dr. Larry Reagan's presentation yesterday from Penn State uh, Global. And uh, it, as he talked about innovation, I know you've heard uh, quite a bit of talk about innovation. Did you talk about innovation, Andy? I didn't well, yeah. OK. Uh, I'm not going to, um, only just that much. But uh, I, I'm going to talk about teaching, because it's what I love to do, and it, it's what got me into this in the first place. And so, uh, you know, I think some of you have heard me say, hey, this is a classroom. I got a, I got a classroom full of people. And, and this is wonderful. So it, it's, it's good to see you all. Uh, <clears throat> I know there are a, are a few dinosaurs in here, like me, who have been teaching since uh, before 1993 when the internet shoved its way into the world. Any, any old classroom teachers here? Okay. A few. I, you know, if there are a lot of people in traditional higher education and even among us, because I'm, I tend to be one of them, for whom um, teaching is a, it was a, a vocation uh, in, in almost the religious sense. And uh, uh, for people like that, for whom it's a passion and a vocation, uh, these are unsettling times, to, to quote Hamlet, time is out of joint. And it, we're, we're going through things that, uh, that nobody anticipated. And so as I think about the response to this, some, some people uh, who are in higher education, I'm sure, are, are saying, this thing I loved, love doing so much, um, and I just have a passion for it. It just ain't what it used to be. It's not what I signed up for, and it just doesn't feel right. And I know there are a lot of people across the country who, who feel that way. Um, they would be right. The world has changed. It ain't what it used to be. Uh, and it may not be what we signed, for, signed up for. So you may not like it one bit. Um, but here you are, and here, here we dinosaurs find ourselves in, in, a, in a new world. Um, now, that angst is a pretty classic definition of cognitive dissonance, and I'm going to talk about that in, in just a minute more. But it all begs the question for the old timers, so, so why do we feel this way? Uh, well, for one thing, the students aren't who they used to be. Um, but then, as a matter of fact, neither are any of us who we used to be. Um, or we ain't what we used to be either. Um, students are demographically far more heterogeneous than they've ever been. And that's a good thing. Uh, teaching college in the 40s uh, was probably, well, Maybe the 40s is a bad example, because that's when the GIs came home, and that really shook up higher education. But before that, it was, it was primarily white and male and pretty predictable. It's not the way the world is now. Uh, in terms of characteristics that our students bring to our classrooms, it's kaleidoscopic. And I think that's one of the best things that could happen to higher education, but it's also one of the most challenging because it creates more uncertainty and ambiguity, ambiguity about how to, how to proceed. Um, I, I, I just was thinking as I was, as I was putting down my thoughts that the idea, <clears throat> for example, of generational studies hadn't even come into being when I was a, a student in the 1960s. And the, the Really, the counterculture of the 60s was for, sort of the harbinger of generational studies as we know them. Now we look at every generation. They all have their, their unique characteristics. Um, you know, in the 60s, we had to come to grips with the 
the, the, the uh, disobedient and insolent students of which I was one and proud of, proud of it. But now they all come with their own uh, characteristics and, and uh, I, well, well discussed identities and possibilities and deficits and challenges and we have to deal with those kinds of emerging things and and uh, and expectations and and speaking of expectations all of that has changed too for higher educators your classroom used to be your kingdom and for those in p through 12 this was my classroom i own it what goes on i am the center of the classroom uh, not that way anymore. The expectations have changed. And for uh, institutions that historically have always been very faculty centered, that role is now occupied uh, by, by a different group. By, by, it's, it's like students occupying the administration building back in the 60s. They, they occupy the center of the institution. And we hear about it all the time becoming learner-centered. Learner-centered as opposed to what? Well, the history of higher education is that generally the institution existed for the pleasure of the faculty and teaching students, and I'm being unfair, but you know, teaching students is what you had to do to have that, that kind of privilege. And, and then finally, adding to all this technology has just turned our entire conception of time place and space upside down. So it, the, the kinds of changes that that, uh, that has brought our, I, I think many of our speakers have probably uh, addressed that. So, so back to cognitive dissonance. Generally speaking, there are two ways to deal with cognitive dissonance. You can change the way you think or you can change what you do. And I was thinking, okay, what what are responses to this by people who loved to teach, but their cheese has been moved, okay? Well, you can say, as I said, I'm not having fun anymore, and I just don't want to do this. This is not fun. And that's perfectly okay. I mean, all of us in our lives will come to a point where we say it's time for a change, and this is not what I enjoy doing. And, and if, if somebody has has that feeling about teaching, then it'd probably be better for their students if they don't stay. Uh, some decide to, to revolt and, and fight a rear guard action. We are going to preserve the world the way it was. <clears throat> and so we're going to mine the bridges and the railroads on our way out to keep things from going. It, it was, it, uh, some of it is a very Luddite response. The Luddites were a, a group in England who, have, uh, they're always thought to be anti-technology. They weren't. They were just concerned about the impact of technology on their jobs and on, on the markets. And as I was preparing, I read some, some uh, commentator who had said that the, uh, uh, today's Luddites are inventing two new technologies so that they can destroy technology faster. No, I thought that was, that was pretty good. Well, it's not going to work. That's part of the problem is that the world is changing, and we, we're going to have to adapt to it because it's not going to adapt to us. We can, we can work all we want to shape it, but our ability to shape it is, uh, is somewhat limited as, as mortals, and, and you see how together we are as, an, as a society right now, so getting that group to move in, in harmony is going to be pretty tough. So we have to make some, some personal decisions. And we can be like, uh, those of you who are old enough to, re to have remember Network, the movie Network, uh, uh, Peter Finch played a, a, uh, an anchor uh, named Howard Beale, and he went, sort of went crazy and, uh, and got on the TV one night and encouraged all of his, his listeners to go to their windows, open them up, stick their heads out and say, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. And, and uh, in the movie you see all these windows in the, in, uh, up and down uh, uh, some of the New York City urban streets sticking their heads out the window and hollering. 
And, and I'm sure that there are people who want to approach the, the world like that. And, and I get that. And we have books now, uh, books and articles. Uh, there's a book that I've mentioned before called The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains, which we all ought to be concerned about, frankly. Uh, although I'm sort of relieved because Twitter's now gone from 140 to 280 characters, so I think we're going to get a lot more meat from our students when they write. <laughs> um, the other, the Wall Street Journal article that, that a bunch of us read a couple of weeks ago that, uh, that asked the question, Are your, is, is, is your smartphone making you dumber? And there's pretty arresting research to suggest that, yes, it probably is and that we need to turn them off and set them down and, and stay away from them as much as we can because they're, they're not good for us in a lot of ways. So we, we do need to, uh, to rage against certain aspects of, of the world. But what, what would it look like if we, instead of approaching it either by resignation and quitting or by anger, if we approached it, a little bit differently, and, and I'm going to be provocative for just a minute. Let's leave tech, technology and economics and dev, demographics behind. When it comes to uh, teaching, if, if we're angry, because teaching ain't what it used to be, maybe we're thinking about that all wrong, because it, that makes it feel like it's all about us. And it's not. It's not about the teacher. It's never been about the teacher. It's always been about the student. Um, and, and if we think about it coming from that point, there, there's, there's something, it, it opens a, a, new, a new vista for us. When you think about it in that way, the, the technologies and the um, demographics and the economics and the technology become challenges. There, there's a book right now that uh, Jane McAuliffe turned me on to called The Obstacle is the Way that I would recommend to anyone uh, who is facing uh, the, the need for change and, and uh, things that are preventing us from doing that. Uh, we can find new and better ways to do this. But at, at its base, teaching is still pretty much what it used to be. And I want you to know that I'm, I'm not, as I said, I'm not going to talk about innovation. Um, I believe in it. I'm working on hard on it. I think it's essential. I don't think we can hold it back. But I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> in fact, I, I was thinking, I was going to tell Andy, uh, he just told me he was going to talk about our innovation agenda. And I said, I, I think there are a lot of a lot of people these days who are just have just had a snootful of talking about innovation. Doesn't mean we're ever going to get away from it, but don't you want to just go back to the good old days? They never existed, but we we all want to go back there. So please indulge me because I'm going to I'm I'm going to go back uh, to a couple of things that I um, talked about last year. Um, Walt Whitman, in one of his poems, said, do I contradict myself? Very well, then, I contradict myself. And because I'm old, I can say, do I repeat myself? Get over it. <laughs> um, the late Herbert Simon, a Nobel Prize winner, uh, he's a professor at Carnegie Mellon, uh, put it in perspective for me. And, and I've quoted this. Uh, and I think, Andy, I think you turned me on to this a few years ago. <clears throat> he argued that teachers are not the critical factor in student learning and that content is not the critical factor in student learning. The student is the critical factor in student learning. Here's what he said. He said, learning results from what the student does and thinks and only from what the student does and thinks. The teacher can advance learning, and I think that's an interesting uh, verb, can advance learning only by influencing what the student does to learn. And I'm going to read that again, if that's OK. So that learning results from what the student does and thinks, and only 
from what the student does and thinks. So by this definition, what is good teaching? Well, it's obvious, good teaching is teaching that influences in positive ways what the student does to learn. That, that sounds pretty simple. So, right? Well, if it were that simple, we wouldn't be here, uh, probably most of us, because we think we can do this better than we do. And we're probably right, we can. If it, you know, I, I always go back to a league of their own, uh, where he says, if it, if it was easy, anybody could do it. And to be a great teacher uh, is something to be, to, to be uh, sought after with much passion, and, and I believe that, um, and, and feel it. I'm going to give you another, another quotation. There's a book that I've referred to before called Innovation in Professional Education, uh, uh, Boyatzis, Cowan, and Kolb. The Kolb, many of you know from your studies, uh, was the, sort of the creator of that, that a, a model of experiential learning that, uh, that I think is, is very uh, useful. Uh, from an educator standpoint, but they say this um, and, and, and I'm going to talk just a bit about their last the last chapter of their book is entitled is titled and, and I think you've heard me say this before what if learning were the purpose of education which which squares with with what uh, Herb Simon said um, Boyatzis, Cowan, and Kolb say this, it is a mistake to assume that teaching and learning are the same thing. What you teach is not necessarily what I learn, and what I learn may be other than what you teach. We make that assumption. I'm teaching, and, and I, I, it, it, it reminds me of the story of the professor trying to justify why uh, his students had done so poorly on a sectional exam who said to the dean, I, I, I covered the content. I, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. And the, his boss said, well, you're, that's not your job. Your job is to make him thirsty. And that's our job. Our job is to make them thirsty. Uh, Pat Cross, I don't know how many of you recognize that name, but uh, one of the great scholars in, in adult learning and uh, now Professor Emerita, but I, I've met her several times and I always just loved her. And she and Tom Angelo wrote, sort of wrote the book on classroom assessment, uh, formative assessment in classrooms that I, I think is, is terrific and would, would recommend. But she did a meta-analysis. Uh, she, she gave a speech to, oh, 10 years ago in which she said, what do we know about student learning? Finally, what do we know about student learning and how do we know it? And so she did a meta-analysis of a lot of the research and came away with only a couple of universals. Um, first, she said the first question we have to ask before we implement any pedagogical strategy uh, is, will it improve student learning? But will it improve student learning? If it won't, even if it's cool, we shouldn't do it. Uh, and I will tell you, that's the one thing I think about as we talk about innovation, which I'm not going to talk about, is to, is to ask ourselves, are we excited about this thing because it's cool and trendy, uh, and, and, and we want to, it differentiates us and we want to be cool, or will we really use it and say, did it improve student learning? Did students learn better because we did this? And that's what we're involved in right now with several kinds of things, is saying, could, are, are these ways that students can learn better, we can help students learn better, and then put them together in new ways that have never been done before? And, and that's the challenge. Uh, I will say, too, that um, she and Tom Angelo make the, the case in that earlier book that I talked about um, 
that most of the research that's done by educational researchers is at, is at such a level of generalization that it's not very useful for teachers in classrooms. Uh, in, in fact, in many cases, a lot of educational research is pretty useless. It's only when you can take it into the classroom and, and make it work. And she comes up with two universals. Students that are successful have, generally speaking, two characteristics above all. They're engaged and they're active. Well, that's not a new concept. Anybody who's studied education, no, you, you can go back to, uh, uh, to Dewey, for example, and Makarenko, I mean, into all kinds of uh, uh, theorists who say it's, it's about being active. And, and involved and engaged and interested and hungry. And, and uh, uh, we, Paulo Freire uh, in, in Pedagogy of the Oppressed talks about the, what our, our normal school of education is uh, called the banking method. It's content driven. We open the head, we pour in the knowledge, we do it by rote. And, and he found that the way that you, uh, the way that he taught the Andean peasants to read was that they read in areas that related to their struggles. And so there was a situated context for it and they, they wanted to learn because they needed to learn. And uh, Malcolm Knowles, in his works, usually said adults will generally learn what they need to learn in order to succeed. Part of the problem is just getting them to realize that it's something that they need to learn. Now, Benjamin Bloom, and many of you know that name, we use Benjamin Bloom's uh, levels of cognitive domain all the time. Benjamin Bloom did research in 1948 he and a couple of his graduate students called the Two Sigma Phenomenon. And I'm going to read the, the results. Bloom found that the average student tutored one-on-one -on -one using mastery learning techniques performed two standard deviations better than students who learn via conventional instructional methods. That is, the average tutored student was nine, above 98% of the students in the control class. I have a couple of response to that. It, it, he also says the 90% uh, of the tutored students attained the level of summative achievement reached only by the highest 20% of the control class. The, the, I have a couple of reactions to that. The first is, duh. Okay. Um, if we could tutor every student one-on-one. -on -one. But also, uh, it seems hopeless because if the other results are that poor. And when you think about how we teach in most of higher education, it's, it's the banking method. Our job is, you know, we put 400 students in a class and we spew information at them and assume that learning is, is taking place. But I, I'm willing to bet that many of you who, like me, sat in a big lecture hall at 7.30 on a Monday morning, we're, <clears throat> we're not active and engaged. Uh, we were present and not present. So Bloom concluded, obviously, that this highly effective one-on-one -on -one method of instruction was uh, impractical. How could you afford to do that? So what he proposed was that we um, use the mastery learning techniques in our other classrooms, and that would be at least a, a, some little palliative to the to the problem. And of course, that doesn't that hasn't worked because uh, our approaches to uh, to teaching are generally based on generalizations. The one the one other thing that Pat uh, Cross said. And that everybody I've been reading lately on the subject says that you can't, you can't 
teach from generalizations about student. Every student is a universe of one. And, and, and that's where the concept of, uh, of learning styles goes south, in my opinion. I'm not a big learning styles advocate uh, because I think learning styles are extremely contextual to the individual and the situation they're in and their interest in the subject and their need to learn the subject and whether or not they're hungry. Uh, there are so many things that enter into that. Uh, every, Every learning style is a universe of one. And it depends on that person at that particular time. That, that to me, is the key to good teaching. It's that one student, it, it's as if I were in that one-to-one -one tutoring situation. Um, but remember, I'm not talking about innovation. So I'm talking about teaching, and with that in mind, I read Bloom's message differently than I would. If I, if I were reading Bloom as a, as a uh, thinking about innovation, I would say, okay, well, look at all these technologies that have come along now. They give us the opportunity to narrow those odds. So with adaptive learning and uh, artificial intelligence and on-demand tutoring, and, uh, and, and a system that supports uh, them getting what they need when they need it at the right time, we can, we can really cut that, you know, cut that down to a manageable size so that the learning can improve. And I, I do believe that. But let me ask you this. Why do you think students who are tutored, who were tutored one-on-one, -on -one, performed at such an astonishingly different level. I mean, 98 percent. That's we don't we don't usually think of 98 percent of any group achieving anything. With the normal curve generally establishes, right? So why? What is it that accounts for that? Personal connection. Okay. Have you, any of you ever tutored? What's it like? What's it like to tutor somebody? And when, when you first approach a tutoring situation, what do you do? How, how, how do you open it? Do you just go right into the content? Talk about life? Find out where they are? what they're doing, what their interests are. You're finding out if there's a fit between you and them from a personality standpoint. You might not be the right t tutor for them. Building you, a relationship. Building, thank you. Uh, that assumes, I'm assuming that that's exactly it. That those students succeeded because first of all, they had teachers, tutors, who were interested and uh, you know, is there a bit of a Hawthorne effect there? Maybe. Uh, but they, they were interested and fascinated, and the students perceived that, and they, they, they wanted to perform because they cared about that person, and they knew that that person cared about them. So why, what is it about that relationship? What, describe the relationship, that, that really good tutoring relationship. That you, for those of you who've had successful encounters, Eric? Uh, age, for sure, as you mentioned, but also compassion, okay. I would say, understanding, and so and empathy and patience. Yeah, listen, I, I only have one job here, and it's to help you learn. And, and I want to do that the best I can, and, and because you know that's how I feel about you, you're you're far more motivated than you otherwise might have been. I mean, I think about, I, I've got a, uh, I have a six-year-old who is wicked smart, and I know um, he is not liking school. He's going to be one of those kids who he, he goes for what he wants, and, uh, and, and the teachers will always say, like they would say about me and probably many of you, you are just not living up to your potential. Um, and I'm still, I'm still working on that. So I, I, I want us to think about that because we have to make it, 
a transition. Another part of Bloom, Bloom uh, had three, uh, three domains. The cognitive domain is the one that we think about most of all, but he also had, uh, it talked about the affective and the psychomotor domain. And the affective has to do with feelings, emotions, psychomotor is the, is the physical involvement. Now, those of you who, who have taught uh, uh, early childhood math, uh, what, what's one of the tools you use to get kids engaged and to learn? Blocks, manipulables, things that are tangible because kids can make sense of that. Now, as they advance in their cognitive levels, they can do more, but, but that's a way to teach those concepts. And besides that, we engage more of the senses. And the more senses we can engage in the, the learning process, the, the more likely that person is to learn. But I want to talk about the affective for a minute. Because to me, of those three domains, the affective is the most critical. It's sort of the gateway drug to learning. It doesn't matter how good your content is if the learner isn't, if we haven't engaged them affectively, if we haven't touched them, if we haven't inspired them, if we haven't gotten them interested, if we hadn't made them feel like this is relevant, they're, why should they spend their time on this other than they have to to get a grade? And when they do that, they're not learning. Now, some people are just so motivated that they come engaged. They're ready to go. But others, most of us, you've, you've got to give me a reason. Help me understand why I need to learn this. And then I will, and, and then help me get what I need to learn it. That's when the content becomes important. Laura and I talk about this, have talked about this all the time. Would you rather have the best content in the world and a mediocre teacher, or mediocre content and a great teacher? Which? Great teacher, any day. Because a great teacher can turn mediocre content into good. But a poor teacher can't even get great content to sing. And so that's, that to me is critical. Now, we're teaching online. Our students are not face-to-face -face with us. I would like them to be more face-to-face -face using virtual means, but they're generally not. So we've got, a, we've got an uphill climb when it comes to this. How, how do you get them excited and engaged when there are a bunch of them in a classroom and you're spending most of your time grading papers and doing discussion posts, which have relative value depending on the degree to which the faculty member is really engaged in that and shows an interest. And then the students generally will respond. What are the keys in an online environment uh, to getting students active and engaged, to getting them affectively to a point where they want to do this, where they see the reason. And they're doing more than just what they have to do to pass the course. Anyone? What are the, what are the keys to engaging students online? How do you do it in a classroom? How do you do it in a regular classroom? Hi, Craig. Um, I think that one of the ways that when I reach out to faculty is I'll reach out to them and screencast into their class. And so what that does for them is it personalizes it. They see exactly what they're doing. It's not a template. It's my voice, my tone. And what that does for them, I've had pushback where they come back and they're like, well, I don't want to use the video tool that you just demonstrated in your screencast. And I'm like, your response to me says that you're engaged. That's what I'm looking for for you. And those faculty that have pushed back like that, when they, they were like, well, maybe I'll try it because you got me to engage. That's where they get it, is that 
it's not the templated use. It's really the using the tools and leveraging them, not throughout the class, but in those places where they can capture that student and be proactive in places where the student is failing. Thank you. So what does that use of a of, of video uh, discussion with a student or groups of students where it may not be everybody can see everyone, it may just be that they can see the faculty member. What, what does that do for the student? Help. Helps, them feel Helps them feel connected. The one thing I love about graduation is we'll have students who will come hoping and in some cases find their faculty member. And all of a sudden that person is real. In our normal classrooms, asynchronous, text-based, we're unembodied. We don't exist, only in some sense out here. And if, if we don't really exist to them, how can we expect them to get excited, especially those who need that help? Some will come and they'll do it on their own. And you know, we have achievers and get out of their way. But the others, it's that relationship. Well, how do you create a relationship? You become human. And how do you become human? You let them see you. And you let them hear you. And all of a sudden, you exist in a way that you don't exist otherwise. One of the, the we're working on a new model, a cohort of one, and one of the aspects of it is that uh, we'd have staggered starts, but faculty members would have one-on-ones with students who enter a class in a particular week for 10 or 15 minutes. If you had one-on-one -on -one with those students in your class, in, in 10 minutes like that, you could get a lot of information. You could help them understand what's required, but you could also start to assess who they are and what it is that's going to get them. What is it that interests them? What can I do to get them involved? How will that affect the way that I respond to them later? Now, you think about the teachers that you've had in your lifetime who you look back and say, I love that person. What did they do? What was it about them? I think I may have told you, I told one group in, in a meeting, I called my <clears throat> fifth grade teacher who is now is in, in his 80s and not in good health. And I, I cried because of the impact that this man had had on a little boy uh, who, who literally changed my life, the direction of my life. Well, that's harder to do online, but it's not impossible. So the first is becoming a human being. Uh, a real person. What's after that? What makes for good teaching online? I was just going to say creating projects that deal with what's going on in their life or in their society, in their, in their world. Because if you give them some real world scenarios that's dealing with what they're going through, then they're going to be more engaged in the process. Thank you. It's along the line of uh, Paulo Freire. One of the thoughts I've had, we, you know, we do papers, three to five page papers. That's our... Uh, but if I'm a nurse and I have to write a report, I can learn the fundamentals of writing through writing a report or if I'm a police officer who has to write an incident report, I can learn by doing that. Or if I'm a, a business student who has to give my boss a succinct one-page digest of something and a recommendation, OK, probably doesn't have APA references. But it provides a situated context that's important to them because they can apply it. Why can't we do that? Why are we 
slaves to a, a, a convention that doesn't produce the kind of results that we really want to produce. So I thank you. That's a, that's a terrific. What else? What do you do to, after that initial thing to get them engaged? Newton, let's get, let's get the... Good. Create, we got create a success experience um, by, by positive reinforcing, you know, so there's an internal or intrinsic motivation. There's a reason to want to continue. Okay, thank you. When, when you, have you ever gotten feedback on something where it was blah feedback? I, boy, don't overexert yourself. I can tell you're in a hurry. And in fact, in fairness to that faculty member, they are. That we have some structural impediments that sometimes get in the way of giving that kind of feedback. In, but in a, you know, to quote Dr. Pangloss, in a perfect world, uh, in the best of all possible worlds, we would have time to do that. What happens when you, you get a handwritten note from somebody who said they were thinking about you? Anybody ever get one? And what, what, how do you feel? They care. It's not like an email and it's not like a text because it took time to do that and effort. And they didn't need to. But all of a sudden, you, that is a way that you say, I care about you. I was thinking of you. You're, you're important. The f feedback we give students on their assignments isn't any different. Uh, if, if they need help, tell them how to improve it. But what did they do well? And when they do really well, just say this is not, not just A, but this is, this is great work. I can tell you really worked hard on this. Uh, your, your, your development over the course of this course has been phenomenal. I mean, imagine getting that kind of message from a teacher that you now like and respect because they're a human being, and they're giving you things to do that are meaningful to you, and, and by their very essence get you engaged. So how do you teach effectively online? Um, there's this book on my desk, and it's called Quiet, and every time I, I'm thinking about whether or not to talk at these things, I'm thinking of that book, and then every time I break, break the rules. So <laughs> here I am again. Andy cannot <laughs> not. <laughs> um, well, I want to back up for a second and just say, you know, I'm thinking of Newton in particular, but, you know, I have as well worked um, in environments with students who really come from true poverty or they're from environments that are, you know, the odds are really stacked against them. And I would say Ashford is not that dissimilar, but in my experience, the number one difference between whether or not a teacher is effective or not it actually comes from a belief, it comes from a mindset. And the best way I've heard that articulated is Damon Lopez, who says in his work with No Excuses University, you have to believe that all students can learn. And you have to believe you are responsible for making that happen. That belief, that mindset, you have to start there. Because if you don't believe that, then students will inevitably fall through the cracks and you won't feel a sense of responsibility for it. So that culture of universal achievement, it begins there. Right, I think that's number one. The second thing I really I like is from Dr. William Daggett. He uses the three R's, and I think this really relates to what you were saying about tutoring. And the three R's are relationships, relevance, and rigor. Relationships makes relevance happen, and relevance makes rigor happen, right? And you can do that way better one-to-one, -one, but I think you can do that in the online environment as well. And that's why I'm so excited about the innovative work, because I think we can free up the faculty to spend more time doing that work. And then the last thing I would say comes from, and this is more to your question about teaching, and I'll just use one example. But if you've ever heard John Gardner talk, who's really become, you know, probably the expert in gateway courses, and he likes to call it an assault on them. And he gives his example, if you've ever heard him talk, where he gives his first semester grades in gateway courses, and it's like a D, you know, two Fs, and it's horrible. And he shows one example where he got a good grade, and he says the difference was that teacher specifically noticed that he was checked out and gave him this book. And the book was really about who do you want to be? And that moment changed his life. 
and caused him to start thinking about his education differently. So as a teacher, you can figure out who your students are, what makes them tick, because you believe that they can actually achieve and you start to figure out ways to really inspire them or as you said, make them, make them thirsty. I could go on forever, I'm gonna stop there. Thank you, no, that was, thank you for oh, disobeying your rule. <laughs> that was terrific. Uh, I wanted to comment that it was Daggett, the, yeah. the R's, one of the R's was rigor. Um, I, th I think it's, uh, well, who are the authors? Uh, seven Principles of Good Practice. Uh, the, uh, back in 1998, but one of, it, feed, volume and quality of feedback is, is one, student and levels of student and faculty engagement. High expectations. Faculty members who have high expectations and communicate those, but to, in the spirit of what Andy said, communicate it in the context of, and you're capable of doing this with, with help and work. Uh, there, there's probably no more, uh, no stronger empirical finding in all of the literature of psychology than the relationship between goal setting and task performance. It's, it's, it's one, almost one to one. And we, we forget that because we teach to the group and to the mean. And, you know, and I, I, I mean, I taught for so many years and graded so many papers. And, you know, I used to say to my students, it's possible for every one of you to get an A. I, I, mean, I don't grade strictly on the curve. Now, my experience is that you won't all get an A because you won't all do what's required to get an A, but that's a possibility. How can I help you get there? So I, you know, I, I think, I think as leaders of the university, we have an obligation to help create structures that will facilitate and allow faculty members to do this and, and, and to, to teach as, as managers of learning. Now, a lot of teachers don't like to think of themselves as managers of learning, but that's what we are. We are managing that learning process for that student. And th nothing wrong with that. I think, I think higher educators don't like that idea of management anyway. It's distasteful. But that's what we're doing. And if, if, we, could, if we can make an environment where faculty members have the the time and the ability and the tools to do that, then we can humanize the classroom. We can make the instruction relevant. We can improve the quality of, of engagement between student and faculty. We can give them the, the best content. Uh, and, and we can guide them with our personalities and the way we care. If we do that, our students will persist. Those are the things that will lead to persistence. They just will. Uh, but like Bloom's Two Sigma, there, there's a cost to doing that. And we're going to have to, we, we've got to crack that knot. But each of us has to, as teachers, do the same. We have to do our, our part in this. So um, I'm, I, I was, really honored to be asked to be here. I think we have a couple of minutes if anybody has, uh, has some discussion that you'd like to, to share uh, with the group. Anyone, anyone? We, we have a comment from the chat, Dr. Swenson. Okay. Um, I would like to put an A in the gradebook on day one and see if it helps student if it helps students work to keep it. Could be a train wreck, but I've always wanted to see it and see if it motivates them by seeing the A and then keeping the A. Yeah, that's a good. That's a really good question. Um, it, it's hard because in the in the environment where we live, where everybody's a winner, everybody gets a trophy. Uh, you, you want them to do something that gives them, you know, that they performed, actually. But it's an interesting premise to start from that and say, you're starting out with an A. 
you can keep that by doing that learning. And, and I, you know, the more I think about that, the more I think there's some, there's some attraction to that. Who's next? Mindy. Yeah, I agree with everything that's been said. Um, but for me, it goes back to getting up every day and going, okay, I made a commitment. I made a commitment to this student. I get, made a commitment to this person with whom I'm working. And I'm going to do the best that I can in this particular moment, like it is the only moment that's ever existed, to hear and understand the unique perspective and the unique needs and the unique way to respond to that person. And then just give myself. I don't need to be perfect. Mm. I just need to be authentic and let that person know that at that one moment, all that matters is helping him or her succeed. It's that commitment over and over and over. I, I love that. And, and every, every interaction with a student is a moment of truth. We, 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 get, to dis, we get to decide, is this, are we going to make a difference with this one? With this particular case, are we going to make a difference? And we may not be able to do that with all, but there are probably, you know, you, you just think incrementally, if I, could just, if I could just do one or two more in a day that, that really go this mile, how, what kind of difference over time could we make? Any other last? This has been a lot of fun. Thank you, and thank you for participating uh, and, and loved being here. Thank you.